Adunola, thank you so much for being here today. Of course, happy to be here. So before, just something that stood out in the bio, how does it feel to have something that you've written help and have been read by over 2 million times? Talk to me, how does that feel? Honestly, when she was reading it, I was like, who is that? Like, <laughs> that, that is Forbes contributor that's got all this stuff going on. It's mind blowing. I mean, I've been writing, I've been, I've had my Forbes column for almost five years now. So it's almost about 3 million at this point, which is really wild. And so to be able to write and connect and empower so many different people through my words is wild. Yeah. It's still wild. <laughs> yeah. What? That's, it, yeah, it's hard to even wrap your head around, right? Yeah. I'm just like, before where do you come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about that before we jump into, you know, the questions about, uh, you know, uh, the topic at hand. I'd love to hear about like, where do you come from? Like, how did this career journey start for you? And, and why do you keep, you know, at it? What, what keeps you going back to it? Yeah. So I started my business about six years ago. Um, and it started from a place of me being in the shoes of my clients. And I say that because before I started my business, I was, I had dreams, right? Like even when I graduated college, I was like, I'm going to get a job. So for my early grads or my, my um, people who are recent grads who probably relate to this, I was like, I'm going to get hired. I'm going to figure it out. And I'm Nigerian. If you can't tell, my name is Adanola Adeshola. Very Nigerian, come from a Nigerian background. When you're Nigerian, your parents think you can only be five things, a doctor, a lawyer, a nurse, an engineer, or a failure. I was a failure to them. Not my parents, but a lot of people in my community because I wanted to go into PR. So I was like, I don't care. I'm going to make it work. I'm going to figure it out. Um, and I started looking for jobs like six months before graduation. I don't know who was going to hire me because I technically hadn't graduated, but I was really serious about it. Um, so, <laughs> so I started looking for a new job. Nothing was happening. Um, I ended up changing my approach. Long story short, I got a job three days after graduating college at a global PR firm that was exactly where I wanted to be, working in the global chairman's office of the CEO who had offices in China and Paris and London and New York. And it was just like fabulous, right, um, yeah. for me. And I thought I was living the dream. Everyone else thought I was living the dream because they're like, look at this girl. She's doing all the things that she wanted to do. No one thought, everyone thought she would be a failure. Here she is working in the global chairman's office. Um, so I was living the dream for a while until I realized that this isn't really what I thought it was going to be. Um, and I ended up, after some time of kind of getting, not getting promotions, not being able to switch, not being able to move at the rate, pace that was right for me, not feeling like I was doing meaningful work, and the yeah. feeling really miserable and lost. And like, what am I supposed to be doing in my life? This was what I always thought I was supposed to be doing. Now I'm miserable. What do I, what do I do from here? And so I was able to pull myself by the bootstraps, get it together. Um, I'm giving you the really fast version um, and, <laughs> and ended up getting a new job from that epiphany seven weeks later. And from that, I was able to, I had a lot of friends who were really successful in their careers, but also miserable and were like, how did you do it? And I ended up piecing together this strategy that I didn't know was going to be a strategy that later has become the strategy that has really helped me and helped so many other high achievers, clients, and those who are in my community be able to level up in their careers and move forward. So I always like to say, I'm really, I'm really where my clients were. Like I know all the emotions, I know the feelings, I know the fears, I know the doubt, and I know what it's like to get to the other side as well. Oh, it's so inspiring, you know, and to be, you know, my, it makes me think of my sister too. She, she from high school, she was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. You know, I'm going to do like this stuff. And then she went out past the bar, practice law, da, da, da. And then gets there. It's like, oh no, <laughs> this is not what I had set my life up to be. And it took some time, right? To process. Right. And I'm curious if you can speak to, especially because people, there's probably people pivoting careers now. And are there, um, and you spoke about the fears are there like common misconceptions that come up with changing careers that, you know, maybe it's just like, is something that you experienced and maybe you see in some of your clients? Yeah, there are a lot of common misconceptions. Um, so some of the misconceptions is that for those of you who already have a level of knowledge and level of expertise, 
that you have to start all over, right? Like you have to forget everything you know to be able to make this transition into this next phase of your career. Um, for example, I had a client who she had after college, got into HR, kind of fell into it um, and really hated it. Like she didn't love it, but after a few years, it kind of just became comfortable. And then she was in year four, um, pandemic happened and, you know, she got furloughed. She was on the verge of getting laid off. And she was like, I've been wanting to change into communications for a long time, but I fell into HR. It's comfortable. I know it. But maybe now is the time for me to do it, but I'm scared because I feel like I have to forget everything I know. And so mm -hmm. that held her back four years from actually making the pivot because she thought that she would have to start over, that maybe she wouldn't be as good in communications because she had spent all this time in HR, or maybe it would be a regret that she would have, that she wouldn't be able to enjoy it as much as she thought that she would. And so that's something that I find a lot of people struggle with when it comes to making that transition where they feel like, maybe it's too late or maybe I'm not good enough or maybe what I've gained so far isn't good enough for where I want to go and so um, in her case she was able to do so and I, we can talk all about the steps that she took um, but she ended up getting a job in an in a communications role at a really great company doing work that allowed her to leverage what she already was doing and so mm -hmm. that's really one of my big core things when it comes to teaching how to change careers is that how do you show up and get hired because of the unique value you bring to the table, not despite of your unique experience, right? Because a lot of times people are like, well, I want to get a, get a good job or move industries, but may, I, I don't know if I can do that because of the experience I have. But how can we do that because of the experience you have, because of the unique background that you bring to the table so that no one else like no one else is like you and you show up being able to believe that and showing other people how to trust that you can get the job done. Oh yeah, that's fantastic. And it's so wonderful to hear this specific story too that I feel like a lot of people can um, relate right. to. Right. Do you think um, with, is that like the main, you talked about the fear of starting over. Would you say that's the thing you see the most that's holding people back from the career pivots? Fear of starting over or another misconception is that, and this maybe isn't a fear, but maybe it's the route that people have to take that they just have to try and get their foot in the door, right? Like we hear that all the time. Like if I could just get my foot in the door, like I'll be good. And it's like, I love to say that every time you try to get your foot in the door, your foot gets stuck because <laughs> you <laughs> You're wearing flip-flops and the door yeah. just. <laughs> you realize there's nowhere else to go because you've kind of pigeonholed yourself into this mm. one little position that you thought you could only get. And meanwhile, you're seeing everybody else now that you're in the door doing work that you really want to do and mm. you feel stuck now, right? And so it's like you got there, but you didn't really get there because it really wasn't where you wanted to be. But you psyched yourself up to think that that was all you can do if you were going to make that. And so I'll say those two things, like the fear of starting over kind of leads to people saying, well, I just have to get my foot in the door. So it kind of is a cycle that we have to break. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do we break that cycle? Right. So that can you impart with us? You know, I know we only have a short amount of time here. But just give us a taste test of some of those steps that you can um, that people can apply that you help them through. Absolutely. And so I say that one, you have to one of the biggest things that you have to recognize how your expertise, where does your expertise, and again, if you're early, if you're early in your career, or if you're mid-career, mid-professional, I believe that you bring some sort of value. You may have some 10 years of experience, sure, but there's something that you're really good at. You know, there's mm -hmm. something that you are um, known for, and so one of the ways you can think about that is what are the things that people really compliment you on that you feel like, oh, like, it's not a big deal, or when your boss is like, oh, we can trust so-and-so to get that done, you're like, oh, I guess so. Like, what are those things you kind of like just brush off and you're like, that mm -hmm. was easy or that didn't take too much. But other people are like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. Like, this is just amazing, right? And right. so there's something that you bring to the table already that is just your thing. It's just naturally, you're naturally good at it. Maybe it's project management. Maybe it's being um, able to think on your feet quickly. Maybe it's being able to have really great client relations. I don't know. I'm making things up. But it's your job to realize what is that thing. And so you want to realize or get clear on what is your expertise and your interest align. So I like to think of like a Venn diagram where it's like you have your expertise, you have your interest, 
And then you want to find roles that are in that middle area, which is what I call the sweet spot, right? So find your sweet spot. And then you want to become aware of your options. So one big thing right now is that everyone wants, not everyone, but a lot of people want to move into the tech industry, right? So like, how do I break into the tech industry? How do I get into it? And a lot of times people think, oh, well, I have to do more of the tech side, right? Well, I have to be a software engineer. I have to be in IT. I have to be customer success if I want to be in this tech industry. But part of changing careers is realizing what are your options, right? Because you may, real, you may want to be in the tech industry, for example, but you may not need to go into tech to do so, right? So for example, I had another client who, um, his name is Edward. Edward was in consulting. He worked at like a two to three person size firm. <laughs> like it was a very small consulting firm. And he wanted to do bigger things. He wanted to move into tech. He was an economist and he wanted to be able to do that work in a bigger, larger scale. Um, and so one of the things that we worked through was where do you fit if you want to be in tech, right? And so what we were able to do is help them just become aware of what those options were. Mm. And we ended up getting a job at TikTok, get this, as a global <laughs> policy analyst. <laughs> like doing exactly the work that he was already doing as an economist <laughs> in this TikTok land, tech landscape without being in tech. Talk right? tech landscape. <laughs> Say that tech <laughs> so, tech, right? So part of changing careers is like, what, what are the roles that allow me to leverage the skills I already have? And what are my options here? Like, yeah. where, what are the industries that I want to be a part of? What, are, what, what do they do, right? How, do, how does my, the work that I've already done align with that? I can share so many stories of just how you can really be able to leverage where you already were to show up as someone who brings a really great skill set to this new place. So becoming aware of your options is definitely important. And then the other thing that you want to do is change your story, right? Because mm -hmm. what got you to where you were isn't going to get you to where you want to be. So if you, mm -hmm. going back to the client who was like in HR and communications, if you keep talking about how great you are in human resources and recruiting and hiring, but you want to move into PR, then they're going to think, oh, you're really awesome. There, right? Like maybe we don't really need you for this, right? And so if you really want to change industries, you have to start thinking about what are the accomplishments that showcase that you can do the job that you want to do next. And maybe it's the same thing, right? Like maybe it is that you're great at hiring, but what part of those skills would be necessary for the next opportunity? And how can you talk about them differently so that people understand that you can do those opportunities? And mm. so a lot of different things that you can do, but those are some of the top three ways that you can start to shift into the next stage of your career and pivot without feeling like you have to lose all the things that you've already gained. Yeah. Oh, I love all of that. Uh, and also we're getting some great questions coming in from our listeners. So uh, feel free to keep those coming and we will uh, get to as many of them as we can. Um, so we were talking about the things that we can uh, use and ways we can pivot without starting over. And um, we had a question that came in from someone named Laverne and they asked, what is the best way to pivot when you're not a graduate? I found many companies won't hire unless you have a bachelor. So here we're talking about, you know, someone that may not have a degree yet um, or, you know, but I've heard plenty of success stories of like, nope, never got a degree and they found their way in. Have you worked with anyone with similar things? Yeah, so some some people I've had have helped people in that in sphere. I'm just curious because not not much context. If this person is an early recent grad, I mean early in their careers and maybe just finding their way, or if this person has already gone in into years of their career and has, is just looking for the next thing. So those are two different things and two different ways to approach the next step because mm -hmm. one has a little bit more of that real life. I've done it already without a degree experience to back up the next phase of their mm -hmm. career. And then one may have to do a little bit of a different approach to show that they have where they're at. So because this is a, you know, early, early career, mid career um, session, I'm going to assume that they're probably someone who maybe is just trying to find their way possibly and doesn't have a background in, or a bachelor's degree. And so what you want to do is build your arsenal right um because 
yes, you may not have a bachelor's degree, but what do you have, right? What, what skills do you bring to the table? What skills maybe are you missing that you can gain without a bachelor's degree? And so when you're looking, so for example, when you're looking at the job descriptions for the roles that you want, what about that job description do you feel like you need, right? And then what are some of those things that you feel like you don't need? And if you don't need those things, how can you gain those skills so that you become an even more competitive candidate, even without a bachelor's degree? Because someone can have a bachelor's degree and still not be great at what they're asking them to do. Because if you really think about it, companies hire to solve problems. They don't hire to give you a chance. They don't hire because they think you're sweet. They hire because they have needs, they have challenges, and they want to bring in people who can alleviate them. So if you, whether you have a bachelor's degree or not, can look at a job description and see what they're asking for and understand where you can meet their problems and mm-hmm. solve them, then you're always going to be a better at a better advantage than someone who has perfect experience. Because honestly, perfect experience is a prerequisite to getting hired. It is not the requirement to get hired, right? Mm-hmm. And so I would say that if you're early in your career, think about what skills can you gain outside of a bachelor's degree that would just set you up to want to build your confidence so that you know that regardless of who else is applying for this job, you know that you can confidently do the role. And then two, also think about what connections, what authentic connections can you build in your community, in your sphere, um, your world that will allow you to be able to learn about opportunities faster, right? Because when you don't feel like when maybe, maybe like when you don't feel like you have all of the different requirements, what you also can still do is build relationships that will vouch for you, right? That will speak for you in rooms that maybe you aren't able to enter so that you're kind of approaching it from two sides where you know that you have the skills, even if you don't have the bachelor's degree, but you also have the relationships that can speak to the value you bring to the table because you've been able to communicate that with them and they trust you despite the fact that, yeah, you might not. So much good uh, advice there and tips. And I think too, what we're talking about or in the, for the first half of that, um, of those suggestions of building those skills, you know, and earlier you were talking about, oh, these things that just come naturally that I kind of brush off. I think what we're kind of talking about, right, are these terms of like hard skills and soft skills, right? So can you, can you define that a little bit for some folks maybe that are like, if they're early careers, like, oh, I hear these terms, but like, what does that mean? Yeah. Okay. So hard skills are like the, like if we go, uh, the easiest way to explain is like someone who's really tech in the tech role, right? So those hard skills are like the engineering skills, right? The coding skills, the, the hard stuff that help you get premium, maximal, maximal tangible results in your role, right? And then the soft skills are more of those um, things that help you be able to do your role smoothly. So whether that's, and I believe that if I, I was going to say leadership skills, but I also kind of believe that leadership is a hard skill that a lot of people probably need to master, right? Um, but for the sake of explaining the two, it's like the leadership, the project management, or the resourcefulness, or the ability to think creatively, or the proactiveness, and like all of those different things. And I'll also submit that when we talk about those things that you easily brush off, those things can also be hard skills, right? Mm -hmm. Like the fact that you can code, for example, the fact that you can code in 15 minutes and it takes someone else 45 minutes or two days is something that you might brush off and think, oh, it's just easy. I love it. Or it's, you know, it doesn't really mean much. But yet that's something that someone's like, we need this person in the room because they can get it done quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Or the fact that, you can get on a phone and calm a client down and create a strategy and a plan and execute that plan efficiently. And you might think, oh, it was easy. Like, I'm just, I love talking to people. No, like you are able to use the hard skills that you've already learned and then take that and create those relationships that create great success, right? And so even if, even though there are separate hard skills and soft skills, it's really important to also still know the things that you feel come easily to you because they can still be either or, but mm-hmm. those things are those things that are part of your value, are part of the things that you uniquely bring to the table that maybe the next candidate doesn't, but that if you don't recognize you bring to the table, then it'll just get overlooked and people won't know that you bring it to the table because you don't know you bring it to the table. 
I love that. It's just these personal inventories that we get to examine and then realize like, oh, not everyone can code that in 15 minutes or whatever it is, right? right. So we got more great questions coming in. Um, there's a real, I love this question from Alana asks, what is the best way to narrow down multiple interests and choose one field or role? I love this because it's such, that's such a personal journey that we all have to go through. But for me, I've experienced like feelings of overwhelm or defeat or just like, I feel frozen because I can't make a choice. And that's like one of my things that I've realized in inventories of like, oh, I freeze up like deer in the headlights. I don't know what to do. For other people, they might be like so excited by so many things. But so how do we parse through all of that? I, so one of the things that you have that I really believe that we have to all understand, because I don't think no one tells us this when we get into our careers, like they just say, find a career, get a job, and then all the best, right? Like, it's like, yeah. no. Good luck. <laughs> what else do I do? <laughs> like, okay, right? And essentially, like, let's say you work till you're 60 and you graduate at 21, for example, you have 59 years of your career. <laughs> like, and the days that you, the days are so gone where you just pick one job, one company, and you stay there for 57 years. Like, that does not happen anymore. So yeah. I think that we have to shift from that whole, I think we've already shifted from that paradigm, but I think that what part of that also is a realization of like your career is a marathon, right? It's mm. not a sprint. It doesn't require you to get on one lane. Like it is full of twists and turns and stop signs and um, reversing and going and accelerating. Like it is full and dynamic and like so many different parts. And My adrenaline is going just from that description right now. <laughs> where you're just on the highway on a Sunday morning, just cruising down, nowhere to go. Like, no, like your career is not like that. So when you really realize that, you can kind of free yourself from this notion of, I have to figure it out once and for all, mm. right? You don't. I don't even believe that you need a five-year plan. Like, I think that if you are the type of person who has a five-year plan, amazing. Plan it out and go after it, right? But if you're that type of person who just can't figure out where you want to be in five years, take pressure off. I mean, these last two years, anybody who said in 2015, this is where I want to be five years from now, had no idea <laughs> what was coming, right? Like, we had no idea in 2020 what life was going to be like. And so I believe that when it comes to even us seeing ourselves from the next phase of life, like you don't know who you're going to be. You don't know what you're going to like. You don't know what things you're going to really enjoy. And so I say all of this so that you can take the pressure off of like, I have to pick one thing. And so mm. when you take that pressure off of like, I have to pick this one thing. It has to be the perfect thing. It has to be everything I need it to be. And if it's not, then I'm a failure and then I'm not good enough. And then I messed up and like, my life is like crap. Like <laughs> when you take that out. Then, yeah. When you get out of that place, you can say, okay, what's exciting for me now, right? What can I do that I don't have to start over, but I can leverage the skills I have and it's going to be meaningful for me, right? Mm. And what does that look like? And being able to just pick and choose from the place that you have a long career to switch and turn and make decisions that are going to consistently be in alignment with where you want to be. I think mm -hmm. is really helpful because there are multi-passionate people out there who maybe don't want to just pick one thing, but how can you start with something so that you can move forward and build that confidence and that um, clarity that this is what I want to do or this isn't what I want to do. Right. That's where we get to find out what are we, what are we drawn to? What, you right. know, why do we want to go back to work tomorrow? Right. right. You talked earlier, so we have just a couple minutes left. We're going to wrap up soon, but um you mentioned earlier about uh, when we weren't, when we we're talking about not starting from scratch, um, we also mentioned connections, right? With other people. Right. So people that are in their early careers or maybe switching mid, how do we make those connections that we know we need, but we don't know where to start? Right. Yeah. So I believe in authentic connections, right? Um, I made the biggest mistake, one of the biggest mistakes, I made many, but one of the biggest mistakes that I made in my early career was thinking like, I didn't need any friends, right? I was like, I have my friends outside of work. I don't need anyone. Like, I don't need to talk to anyone, right? Um, and that's a big mistake. So 
I would say that one of the things that you have to just believe right now is that you can do it by yourself by working hard. But if you mm -hmm. want to do it faster, work on building great relationships because mm -hmm. those relationships will help you and help you navigate and overcome trial and error that you probably could skip, let me tell you, right? Um, and so one of the ways that you can build great relationships is by one, building relationships at work, two, building relationships with people in your industry. Um, and so what, the way that you can start that is by really just thinking about who do I want to learn from? Who is, is achieving the career goals that I hope to one day achieve? Don't wait until you just start meeting a, when you, you need a job to start building these relationships. Although there are ways to do that successfully when you need a job, right? But if you can set yourself up for success from the beginning by just being curious about other people, by just wanting to learn from other people, especially right where you are, if you do happen to love the job that you're in, um, then that will set you up to be able to have the receipts, right? The, the, the community, the people who can say, hey, oh, I know you're good at this. Or, hey, you told me you want this. I thought about you for this, right? And so really think about not just how do I build relationships transactionally, but really how do I make sure that I'm building relationships in a place of authenticity because I genuinely want to learn from this person. I genuinely believe in what they're doing and I think they're interesting. I think they're cool. I admire them. Mm, beautiful. Well, these this has been such a, uh, the adrenaline speed on the highway. I feel like we just did that together in these 30 minutes. So thank you so much. Um, I, we could talk all day. I wish we could, but there's yes. more <laughs> panels ahead. But in the meantime, how can people stay connected with you and uh, reach out? Uh, are there any resources that you would like to recommend? And just how do we plug in to you? Yes. So I definitely have a um, free guide on how to go from zero interviews to dream job offers. And I was thinking just now that I have another um, resource I'm going to drop in the chat and then you guys will probably get it later. But it's all about um, how to do everything we just kind of talked about. If you're feeling lost, if you're not having clarity, if you're not sure what to do to really stand out, um, it's part of the Stand Out Kit. So you can get more details on it. Awesome. And is, are you on any of the socials? I assume LinkedIn is part of your, part of your practice. I am on LinkedIn at Anola, at Ashola, and I'm also on Instagram at the new employees. And so you can find us there as well. Awesome. All right, Adi Anola, this was so fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and I hope you have a great one, rest of your day. And thank you for making the time today. Of course. Thank you. Honey. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs>